1 Samuel chapter number 22. 1 Samuel chapter 22. I want to say thanks again to everyone last week uh, uh, and to the church as far as uh, I had a birthday last week and uh, the cake and everything like that. That was awesome. I appreciate that. And, uh, and I didn't know this that uh, until just the other day that Mine and Brother Jeremy Chuck's birthdays are only five days apart. But we're a little bit more than five days apart in age. About a, just a little bit. I'm 43, he's 23. So, you know, I'm kidding. But, uh, but anyhow, I do find that interesting. And uh, it's interesting to find out the older you get, wow, there are adults that are a lot younger than you are. So, well, but it doesn't bother me. It's good, right? Getting older is a good thing, right? So, uh, but anyhow, so we're going to be, hopefully, um, in two places tonight, uh, with the Lord's help, and we'll go through this. Um, we've been going through the life of David, and as we've been not just going through the life of David, just walking through 1 Samuel, and everything we learned, and I've learned a lot from it, and we've seen a lot of different things, and uh, we're going to read a passage here in just a moment, and in this particular chapter, um, there's a song that goes along with it. And with the Lord's help and me moving quickly, probably definitely on the second in there, uh, we'll get through part of that psalm as well. But I want to ask you a, kind of a question. You see the title tonight is The Inhumanity of Humanity. And, you know, if you think about it, when you turn on the news or maybe you look at something online, you know, there are things that happen when people just act very inhumane to other people. You read about tragedies and things that have happened, and, and uh, I know... There's different conspiracy theories, all different kind of stuff. But either way you look at it, the way that sometimes human beings treat other human beings and such a carelessness about someone else's life. Uh, I was just thinking of some various things. You know, when you think about uh, September 11th, and, and again, when you think about all those people that died, and then the whole idea of the Oklahoma City bombing, if you might remember some of that. And, and even if you go a little bit old school, a little bit like in my day, if you think about people, like if I say the name Jeffrey Dahmer, some of you might remember that. It killed many, many people. And when you hear about that and see those kind of things where you see such tragedy and such terror, if you will, of, of people that are so careless and evil, if you would, in the treatment of other people's lives, it kind of makes you feel a certain ways sometimes, don't it? Like, uh, I know exactly where I was, exactly what I was doing on September 11th. I know exactly everything about it. And like I said, Whatever you want to do in thoughts and theories of that, at the end of the day, people still have their lives snuffed out, either way you look at it. And when you think about the inhumanity of that, you know, what does it make you think? Sometimes it makes you feel fearful, right? You kind of feel a little scared. Maybe it makes you worried. Maybe sometimes it makes you angry, right? You may be more angry or different things. And you have all these emotions and feelings. And I want us to think about the idea of this, is how do we respond to that? How do we as believers, when human beings are very inhumane, if you would, how are we going to respond to that? How, how are we to deal with that? Because, let's just be honest, the Bible says evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. And, and if we continue to live, we're going to see a lot more stuff. I mean, definitely in our lifetime, you think about our kids and grandkids, some of the things that just because of how readily available with internet and television I mean, things at your fingertips that you can hear about and know about now that maybe you couldn't know about 20, 30, 40 years ago. And I want to read this part of this chapter in 1 Samuel 22. Uh, last week we did the first five verses of it, and, and really with the idea of, of looking at David as he was escaping from Saul. And so just to let you know in case you want to know where we're at, uh, David is full-blown on the run now. So David's been anointed king. Saul is not saying, I like you. Say, Saul's saying, if I find you, I'm going to kill you. And Saul has really become mad and obsessed with destroying David. And we hear about this in verse number 6. And I'm going to read through these. And I like I said, several verses here. But if you just follow along in 1 Samuel 22. It says in verse 6, when Saul heard that David was discovered and the men that were with him, now Saul bowed in Gibeah under a tree in Ramah, having his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing about him. Then Saul said unto the servants that stood about him, Hear now, ye Benjamites, 
Will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds? That all of you have conspired against me. And there is none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse. And there is none of you that is sorry for me. Or showeth unto me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait at this day. Verse 9. Then answered Doeg the Edomite, which was set over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob to Ahimelech the son of Ahitub. And he inquired of the Lord for him, and gave him victuals, or food and supplies, and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Then the king sent to call Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house, and the priests that were in Nob, and they came all of them to the king. And Saul said, Hear now, thou son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here am I, my lord. In verse 13, And Saul said unto him, Why have you conspired against me, thou and the son of Jesse, and that thou hast given him bread and a sword, and hast inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me to lie in wait as, as at this day? Then Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who is so faithful among all thy servants as David? which is the king's son-in-law, and goeth at thy bidding, and is honorable in thine house. Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me. Let not the king impute anything unto his servant, nor to all the house of my father, for thy servant knew nothing of all this, less or more. And the king said, Thou shalt surely die, Ahimelech, thou and all thy father's house. And the king said unto the footmen, or the soldiers that stood about him, Turn and slay the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David, and because they knew when he fled and did not show it to me. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. And the king said to Doeg, Turn thou and fall upon the priest. And Doeg the Edomite, and he fell upon the priest and slew on that day fourscore and five persons that did wear the linen ephod. And Nob, the city of the priest, smote he the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and suckling, and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. Let's pray and we'll get into our study. Blessed be thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of heaven and earth. And Father, as we look at your word tonight, God, we still want to praise you for all that you do. God, there are many times in my life that I do not know why things are happening. But God, I believe in studying scripture like this. God, there's lessons for us today about how you are sovereign and how we should continue to trust in you. I thank you, God, that nothing takes you by surprise. And Father, I ask you tonight that you would be with us as we look at your word, as we study this tragedy. That, God, you would be with all of us. God, I don't know what's going on in the minds and hearts of the people in this room. But, Lord, I pray for the next few moments that you would have our hearts and our minds just at peace and be still and to see exactly what you have for us tonight. God, I pray you might use me in spite of me. Forgive me of my sins where I fade. And Father, I thank you for all you do in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And so looking at the idea of the inhumanity of humanity. And our passage uh, tonight really describes this tragedy of the killing of the priest at Nob. If you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about this. We talked about David is on the run and he goes to the city of Nob. It's known as the city of priests. And if you remember, David lies to Ahimelech the high priest. He lies to him to basically he's starving and, and Ahimelech the priest gives him food and he even says, hey, do you have a sword? And Ahimelech goes, well, the only sword we have is the sword of Goliath, which conveniently enough, an interesting sword there. He says, I'll give you the sword, I'll give you that. But David did not be very forthcoming with Ahimelech. And what we read tonight is what I see is partly David's fault for not being... Uh, forthcoming with Ahimelech, but also we're going to see what happens when we allow rage and selfishness and self-pity to overwhelm us. And as I said, we see in our society today, we don't even have to go to scripture. We can look around today in our society and think, my goodness, how inhumane can you be about some of the things that you see happening and some of the things that we hear about today. And I want us to see this kind of this whole thing and we talked about a couple weeks ago that eventually Saul was going to find out and Saul ultimately in my opinion is really striking out against God lashing against God when he does this and I want us to see kind of in going through this passage quickly because in Psalm 52 
you get kind of David's response to what happens. Again, I just like to always preface it with this. I love reading Psalms, but Psalms are a lot better when you know the context of what is going on in the process. And so what happens at the beginning of this, in verses like 6 through 8, Saul finds out that David has escaped. And as he's found out David has escaped, Saul basically starts throwing a pity party for himself. By the way, have you ever thrown a pity party for yourself? Don't raise your hand. Okay, I like that. Don't raise the hand of somebody else. But you know what that looks like on the inside when you start to feel sorry for yourself and you start to kind of do that tantrum, so to speak? And you're going to kind of see here from Saul what it looks like on the outside when you start to have this big pity party and, and the way he acts here in this. And, and so basically, like I said, Saul finally learns that David and his men have kind of got away from him. And so what does Saul do to all the men that are standing around him? He starts accusing him, right? He starts accusing him. He says, is there nobody going to help me? Everybody's against me. The world's against me. Everybody hates me. It's kind of like, if you like Winnie the Pooh, Eeyore, it's kind of a person I love. Remember Eeyore? Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. Woe is me. Is Eeyore. You just want to go, you want to smack Eeyore. It's what you want to do, right? It's that mentality. Is that everybody's against me. But can I be honest with you? We can live our days as believers thinking that everyone is against us. And I'll be honest with you, I am not a very fruitful Christian when I run to self-pity. And can I tell you, you're not even. When you run to self-pity because of circumstances and kind of these trumped up ideas of what's going on in your head, if you're not careful, it leads you to self-pity. And because, like I said, all these soldiers are standing around Saul and he's like, all of you are against me. And so he gets, he gets not only the self-pity, but he gets very paranoid. Now, I'm not going to ask you if any of you are paranoid about things. But uh, he gets paranoid, like everybody's out to get him. And so I read this about Oswald Chambers said this in his devotional, My Utmost for His Highest. He said this, self-pity is of Satan, and if I wallow in it, I cannot be used of God in that moment for God's purpose. That self-pity is of Satan, and if I wallow in self-pity, I cannot be used of God in those moments for his purpose. Think about it. How fruitful are you when you have the self-pity mentality? Not very, not very much, is it? Who do you want to serve when you have self-pity? No, because everything's inwardly. It's looking that way. And so you see he has this mentality, and to keep going. So finally in verse number 9, we see Doeg. And if you remember Doeg, and I remember thinking what a weird name Doeg is, you know. And if you remember Doeg was there. Remember he was the guy that was there at Nob when David came back in chapter number 21. And he kind of listened, and he's a traitor. And by the way, when you read in chapter 21 about Doeg, he just has that movie feel of like this villain coming on the scene kind of thing. And so Doeg speaks up, and like again, he's the villain, I think, of this, and says, hey, I know where the son of Jesse is. I know what happened to the son of Jesse. By the way, in that day too, what even disrespect that it was, he wouldn't even call David by his name. He called him the son of Jesse. That was a disrespectful title instead of calling them by their name in that situation. And so he refers to him that way. And so in this situation, you're sitting here with Saul has got this self-pity, this paranoia, if you will. Everyone's against me. And finally, Doeg goes, hey, I see a chance for me to move up the ladder. I see a chance for something to, to help me out. And we see Doeg's ambition in what he tells him. He says, you know what? Your priest over in Nob, Ahimelech and the guys, they helped David get away from it. They're helping David. And as you see here, it just enrages Saul. And Saul calls for him in verse number 11, and he calls him to come. And he basically even doesn't even address him by his name. In verse 12, he says, Hear now thou, son of Ahitub. And you notice the respect that Ahimelech gives. He says basically, yes, my Lord, I'm here. And Saul accuses Ahimelech of conspiring against him. He accuses Ahimelech of helping David in his rebellion against Saul in this. And the truth is, and as you know, Ahimelech had done nothing wrong. He had done nothing wrong, but Saul and his paranoia and his self-pity, man, it just floods him. And he keeps thinking to himself, no, no, you've aided the enemy. Now, you've got to understand something when you read Scripture. For someone to be guilty of aiding an enemy against a king, you know what that means, right? You're a traitor. That means you're worthy of death. And so in Saul's mind, his self-pity and paranoia 
led him to justify without having any facts that Ahimelech needs to die. By the way, just a little side note, I think through this study tonight, there may not be one main nugget for you. There might be little things along the way. But can I tell you something that this lesson has taught me is that when I go to self-pity and I get paranoid and I'm all focused on myself, be careful because I will justify things that I do without having all the facts. You ever jump to conclusions on something and only find out you are the big goober that, you know, it, it wasn't all right? It's all right. You can call yourself a goober, okay? It's all right. But, you know, you think to yourself, you're like, and you get so angry and you get so frustrated because of this whole situation. And as we find out here, Himalek hadn't done anything wrong. And Saul is just going off rumor and hearsay. But Ahimelech's motives, I want to understand something. He did not know David's intentions. He, David was not forthcoming with him. And Ahimelech, I find very interesting in his, um, maybe his motives here, they're pure. And when I see something here, I notice this kind of thinking about pure is in his motives. And, and I have this in my notes too, and thinking about Saul, it's a question I have. It says, have you ever accused someone for no reason? Have you ever judged someone before learning all the facts? I, I'm not going to be too transparent here, but I'll just say, haven't we all, in one sense, looked at somebody, thought you had them figured out, to only find out later, you judged that book totally wrong. And maybe, if we're totally honest, saw somebody, heard something about somebody, saw them, and then maybe even spread gossip to other people, to change other people's view of somebody before you ever got to know them and know the truth. I think we all can say, oh me to that, okay? We love to say amen, but I think oh me is probably the better way of saying it in that. And so we've done that. And, and Saul here is so focused on himself rather than God, and this is be honest, this pathetic self-pity turns into accusations and even intimidation that he's coming at him here. And so Saul accuses him, and Abimelech, excuse me, Abimelech, Abimelech, excuse me, boldly stands up for not just himself, but David. If you would, look, in, um, look at a verse number, make sure I get it right here, verse number 14, okay? It says, Then Abimelech answered the king and said, And who is so faithful among all thy servants as David, which is the king's son-in-law, and goeth at thy bidding, and is honorable in thy house? And what I notice here is something very interesting. Abimelech when he refers to David, he uses him by name, but he does something. And Himelech here stands up for those who cannot stand up for themselves. Obviously, David was not there. He could not speak for himself. And I love how Himelech here, he very boldly stands for David's defense. I kind of think Himelech would have been a pretty good lawyer, but anyhow. But he kind of puts a very powerful defense for David here. Now, by the way, Saul's already at the point he's ready to kill Ahimelech. But I notice Ahimelech has some integrity. He says, you know what? What you believe about David is a lie. And I'm willing to tell the truth about who David is. And he really, he risked his own life even more in the situation. And I see things just in that one verse, verse 14. He tells Saul five things about David. One thing he says is, he calls David what? He calls him your servant, because Saul's servant. Second thing I see in the middle of that verse, what does he say? He affirms David's loyalty to the king, that he is a loyal servant. Thirdly, he says, hey, don't forget, this guy's your son-in-law. Okay, he's your son-in-law. And fourthly, he says, he says you, he's the captain over your choice men or the bodyguards. And then fifthly, he points out, even at the very end of verse 14, he says, it's basically, is there anybody that's honorable in your whole house, Saul? It's David. And I just, I appreciate here how Ahimelech, knowing that he's taken his own life in his hands, but he's faithful priest before the Lord because he bravely defends David, even to Saul's face. And I, I appreciate that. I think that's very good in that situation. There's a verse over in uh, Psalm 31, verse number 8 and 9, and talking about how David's not there to defend himself and how Ahimelech speaks up. It says, it says, Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are excuse me, appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. So when you see that verse there, the word dumb means those that can't speak for themselves. It doesn't mean those that are ignorant. What it means is the idea there is speaking up for those who cannot speak up for themselves. To speak up, to judge fairly. And that's what Ahimelech does here. He speaks up for David to judge him fairly. And I'll just tell you in this, and just like a little nugget again if you want to do it. 
is that I think in our lives we need to speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves. We need to sometimes when you hear stuff about people, maybe instead of just jumping on the train and thinking it's all right and good, maybe we need to stand up for that person and say, hey, well, maybe we don't know what they're going through. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe we don't know the whole story. Before we jump to conclusions, before we become the judge, jury, and executioner, maybe let's, maybe let's find out what's going on for them. And the thing is in our life sometimes, I think sometimes we're so concerned about ourselves that we're willing to allow others to be destroyed just so we're okay. Because, I mean, if I stick my neck out for them, what are they going to think about me? You know, in that situation, I think it's just something good for us to remember. But if I look here also, Ahimelech kind of defends himself. He says in verse number 15, he says, Did I not then begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me. Let not the king impute anything unto his servant, nor to all the house of my father. For thy servant knew nothing of all this, less or more. And so Ahimelech kind of speaks up for his own defense, saying, Hey, I didn't know, really know anything of David's purpose. I didn't know he was on the run. And sees, I didn't know anything about the situation. He says, I am your servant, Saul. I have been your servant. But we see Saul here, even after Ahimelech finishes his defense, Saul now goes from this inward self-pity, this outward intimidation, if you would, to what I call a striking against God or this idea of a upward um, aggression, if you would. And I have in my notes here, once again, self-pity can lead us to places we don't want to go. It started off filled with self-pity. And then what does Saul finally say at the end in verse 16? Ahimelech, not only are you going to die, all your family is going to die, all these priests are going to die. And they're all innocent. He said they're all going to die. And then we read some of the, in my opinion, some of the most tragic things, things that you like to see on the news that, that are tragic in these things. And Saul looks at his soldiers, his footmen. He says, kill them all. Now I've got to stop for one second and see something. I don't know if you noticed something in that passage. In verse 17, when Saul turns to his soldiers, his footmen, and tells them to kill him, what do the footmen do? Nope. Do you notice what Saul even calls Ahimelech? The priest of what? The Lord. He says, kill him, the priest of the Lord. And I see even in this the integrity of the footmen, of the soldiers saying, we're willing even to put our own lives in our hands to risk that because we're not going to touch God's anointed in that. And by the way, I think there's a lot to understand in that in our lives that we ought to be careful when we mock people and make fun of people because in a sense, when we do that, we're not just striking against them, we're striking against God when we do so. Remember David said, against thee and thee only have I said. And so we see they're not willing to do it and then they're like, we're not willing to do it. And then finally in verse 18, what happens? There's Doeg again. And Doeg finally, Saul turns to him and says, Doeg, he says, you kill him. And this was finally the opportunity that Doeg was wanting to promote himself. And what does it say he does in verse number 18 and 19? He kills 85 priests. Kills them all. Just slaughters them. This is not a war. This is not a battle. This is taking innocent blood. Innocent life. In fact, it goes on and says, and he killed 85 of those who wore the linen ephod. The linen ephod there, by the way, was the official sign of priesthood. Like that was them set aside for that. So you see a massacre here. But I noticed something about Doeg. He doesn't stop at Saul's command. What else does he do? He goes on to not just kill them, but to go to the town of Nob. And he kills every man, every woman, every child, every baby, every bit of cattle, everything about it. Kills everything. Now, I find something interesting. If you remember back, I believe it's 1 Samuel chapter 13. What did God, through Samuel, tell Saul to do to the Amalekites? Kill them all, right? Kill them all. Remember, Saul didn't do that, right? He disobeyed God for selfish reasons. But God said to the Amalekites, kill them all, cattle, everything, do all that. And you notice how he did not obey that for selfish reasons. He did not do that to the enemy, but he did it against his own people and did it against his own town and not just an old town, but against the priest. And can I tell you something about self-pity? If you're not careful, self-pity will have you turn on the ones that you love far quicker than you ever will your enemies. 
and they turned on their own people when you think about this. And this is just a side note, um, and because I just like a lot of facts about that cool stuff. But if you remember in 1 Samuel chapter number 2, you remember Eli as the priest before Samuel? Do you remember what God told Samuel to tell Eli? Because of your sin, because of not restraining your sons, Hophni and Phinehas, that none of your house will live to be old men. This is a fulfillment of that prophecy. Very interesting how the fulfillment of that prophecy happened. And Eli told him that. Now, I want to tell you something. This prophecy is fulfilled in this killing of the priest of Nob by the hands of Saul and Doeg. But I want you to understand, just because the prophecy is fulfilled does not mean it was not unrighteous for Saul to do these actions. You say, well, hey, if it's prophecy, then obviously Saul and Doeg are greater, right? No, no, no. It's still unrighteous. It's still sinful in that. You want me to give you an example? Was it God's will for Jesus to die on the cross? Absolutely. Was it still evil and sin that the men that nailed him and killed him to the cross? Absolutely. It was a fulfillment of prophecy. But that just shows me how God is sovereign even over the evil and inhumanity of man in that. And so we see that. And so anyhow, as you read this passage and you see it, this happens, this great terror. But look in verse number 20, if you will. It says, And one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled and fled after David. Verse 21, and Abiathar showed David that Saul had slain the Lord's priest. And David said unto Abiathar, I knew it that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, for I have occasioned, or I am the reason, of the death of all the persons of thy father's house. Abide thou with me, fear not, for he that seeketh my life seeketh thy life. But with me thou shalt be in safeguard. So we see Abiathar, he's the son of Ahimelech, he escapes, and he shares with David this terrible news of what Saul has done. And I do appreciate this about David. David does not say, that's a terrible thing. What does David say? This is my fault. If you remember a few weeks ago when we studied this, remember what we said. David should have at least been honest with Ahimelech and allowed Ahimelech the ability to make the right decision with what he told him. Can I tell you, sometimes when we are dishonest with people, we take out of their hands the opportunity for them to do what's right or to do what's wrong. And a lot of times they suffer because of it. And we see here that David accepts responsibility, and we also see in that he offers protection in this way. There's another verse, I believe, if I got it here, in uh, Proverbs 28, 13, if I got it right. Just to make sure. Sometimes technology is not fun to count on. But talking about this with David owning, he says, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. So, whose fault was this that it happened? Obviously, Saul and Doeg did it, but you got David here, right? And you notice what David does? He confesses his sin. He makes it right. And what does God do to him? God shows mercy. In a few years down the road, as we'll read many chapters later, in David's sin with Bathsheba, what does David take a long time to do? Confess. I believe God had mercy and grace for David that he rejected because he wasn't willing to confess that he was wrong, that this was of his fault. And so we study this and look at this tonight, and I just think to myself a few things and looking at it. You know, I think to myself the idea of this. You say, Phil, I'm not really concerned about self-pity leading me to kill people. Well, let's just be honest. A lot of us, we don't have the uh, power <laughs> of somebody like Saul. But let me ask you this. Do you know of somebody that likes to do like Saul did here that only takes pleasure in putting other people down? They're almost like they build themselves up in putting other people down. And I see that with Saul. But may I tell you, in the life of a Christian, it has no place for us to belittle, to destroy, to put people down just to try to build ourselves up. There's no place for that in our lives. We should not allow that to be a part of our lives. And I know I've said this, and our time is, we got a little bit of time left. But I want to just go over a little bit of Psalm 52 with you here. Uh, Psalm 52, just so you know, it's kind of God allows us to see what David learned about this tragic slaughter, if you would. And God kind of inspires him here. And 
And if you look at Psalm 52, I don't know what the inscription, exactly the words are there for you. I know in my Bible here, I know many Bibles have this. It says in Psalm 52, it talks about a Psalm of David when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul and said to him, David is coming to the house of Ahimelech. And so we see this here. It's basically, this is David's response. Now you say, Phil, why are you getting into this? Why not just let us go? Well, the reason is, is you and I are going to get to see a lot of inhumanity in our lives. We're going to see some horrible things. And how are we going to respond to that as believers? Or is it going to always make us fearful? Is it always going to make us angry? Is it always going to make us lash out? What is it going to do? And I want us to see this here. And I like to look at the first few verses here in Psalm 52, verse 1. Why boastest thou thyself? Now think about David and his response to all these priests and these people, men, women, children, die. Why boasteth thyself in mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. The tongue deviseth mischiefs like a sharp razor working deceitfully. Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than speak righteousness, say love. Thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living Selah. Now at first glance when I'm reading this, and this is my opinion and how I feel about this, at first glance when you read this, you would think that David's referring to Doeg at the beginning, wouldn't you think? But in reality, I think verse 7 pinpoints that he's, this psalm is not, he's not blasting Doeg here. He's actually pinpointing Saul. Look at verse 7. Lo, this is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. And he says here about the, the wealth that's applied to this jealous king. I really believe personally that really David is writing this against Saul. He's not writing it against Noah. Because he talks about out of your wealth, out of your power, you're just trying to build yourself up by destroying other people. And, and David's actually assuming, I think this is Saul, verse 1. And if that's true, it strongly suggests, in my opinion, that, that Saul not only uh, murdered these innocent people, put them to death, but, and many of them priests, but he also bragged about it. Because you see verse number 1 again? Why boastest thou in thy mystery? So if I'm reading that right, Saul not only had them killed, but Saul bragged about it. Now you talk about the inhumanity of things. You ever seen someone that did something, like I said, you mentioned somebody that's a mass murderer, or someone that does something that kills lots of people, and it happens and you see their face, but then for them to brag about it and how awesome they are, how wonderful thing it is in that, that's how mad that's how consumed and selfish Saul had gotten to that point. And Psalm 52 verse 7 tells us a lot about the ego of King Saul. Because what does it say in the passage? That he grew strong. What it says, Thou hast not made God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches, and strengthened himself in his wickedness. You know what that means? Saul enjoyed growing by destroying other people. Now, I said it just a minute ago, but have you ever known anyone who made him or herself feel better by always putting other people down? And we have to be careful of that because we can do that very innocently in the sense of we're not out to destroy somebody, but we love attention. We love being the best at this or the best at that. And so sometimes we'll step on people to try to build up our reputation, build up what other people think of us. I'm kind of joking, and not to this degree. Uh, back in Tennessee, we had in, in our youth group we had there, we had this one kid in the youth group. He always did better than anyone else. Like you've asked him what he do. Oh, I've done that better. Well, I say I've climbed that mountain. Well, I've climbed three. You know, kind of thing like that. He's always well. I've, I I made 20 points in a basketball game. Well, I made 30 points in a basketball. Everything he did. Hey, I made a hole in one. Well. I made a hole in one on a par five. You know, he would say something crazy. He was always that way. So one day we were going bowling as a youth activity, and I looked at him, and, and some of the kids were talking, and I, I can't say this is my best moment, okay? All right? I looked at him, and I said the kid's name, and I said, I said, yeah. I said, how many, oh, I said, how, how many of you guys bowl? You like to bowl? And 
One kid's like, yeah, I bowled a 200 before, and, and I bowled this before, and all that before. And he spoke and goes, I bowled a 350. <laughs> In case you don't know anything about bowling, you can't get over a 300. I said, 350. Then my flesh is like, well, it's time to bet some money, boss. But I didn't do that. Okay, I didn't do that, kid. Didn't do that. I said, really? He said, oh, man, I'll beat everybody here. I'll beat everybody here. I bowl a 350. Yeah, I bowled a 67. <laughs> Some of you are like, man, 67 sounds awesome. I would love to bowl 67. Okay. We'll have a bowling activity or whatever, okay? But what it was, this kid was, now listen to me on this part. He was so grossly insecure about himself that he had to tear others down to build himself up. And can I tell you, Whenever we have to tear down other people to build ourselves up, it just shows how insecure we really, really are. And if we're not careful, we all can run to that. You're saying, Phil, I ain't going to run to no place where I'm killing 85 priests and all. I get it. But David says, you're, you're strengthening yourself by destruction, by tearing other people down. And that insecurity can get us that way. And I don't want us to miss, and I know our time's up, a very wonderful lesson in verse number 8 of, that David says in Psalm 52. He says, But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. Now remember, David's still on the run. He's in the forest of Arad here. But even on the run, and David not even knowing where his next meal is, David knew that in comparison to Saul, he says, I'm going to grow in the house of God, and I'm going to trust forever in the mercy of God. Even when things are unimaginable. And I close with this tonight. When I look at this passage of scripture and looking at how does David respond in the face of tragedy? This gross, inhumane tragedy. I think there's some things we can get from it too. I see and I just give it to you we'll be done. Our time's up. First I say he places blame where it should be placed. Verses 1 through 4, he blames Saul, and he blames evil, and he blames sin. When we see things happen, we need to put the blame where the blame needs to go. Okay? But secondly, I see he reminds himself that God will repay. Verse 5, he talks about that. That God will repay. It goes really great what we looked at this past Sunday morning, right? Romans 12, 19. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. That it's not for us to have vengeance, that God will do that. But I see the other thing about it is that he placed his hope solely in God. You see that in verse 9 where he says this. In the midst of all that tragedy, he says, I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it, and I will wait on thy name for it is good before thy saints. And that's what he does. The last thing I have there is that what does he do? He reminds himself that God is good. Look what he says in the end of verse 9. For it is good before thy saints. And it's kind of a different lesson here because I don't think we're going to see a lot of this. But I'm telling you, we live in a day and age where we're going to see a lot of the inhumanity of humanity. But we have to respond differently than the world. We definitely don't need to respond like a soul. We don't need to have that insecurity. We don't need to have that self-pity that can lead us to doing things and justifying things that just aren't true. We need to be like David here in the midst of that, hey, if we need to own it, own it. But we need to put blame where blame is, and we need to remember at the end of the day, God is sovereign. And by the way, I am grateful every day for the sovereignty of God. Aren't you glad there's nothing that will happen in your life that God does not know about, and it's not part of his will to make you more like him? doesn't mean you're going to enjoy everything. A lot of things that God does to make me like Christ that I'll be honest, I do not enjoy but no one really likes enjoying running and doing all and working out, doing those things at the beginning, do you? Because it stretches us. It makes us more like him. But at the end of the day, we need to remind ourselves in the midst of all kinds of tragedy that God's still good. God's good. And that God is for us as believers, and nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Hebrews 11, 11 says, talking about Sarah, that what when she was told that she would have a baby, even in her old age, and she says, and she counted him faithful who had promised. 
that in the midst of all you face, that God's still faithful and that God's still good. And so again, like I said, I don't know exactly what all you might take from that tonight, but maybe if nothing else, let's just figure out, let's respond to tragedy in a way that would please God. And we see a way here out of Psalm 52, and God just happens to call David a man after his own heart. Let's stand together and we'll close in prayer. By the way, don't forget about our sign-up list for our uh, VBS stuff there in the back. Father, we thank you again for the day. We thank you for all that you do for us. And, and Father, as we read this story, and it just seems such a terrible story, but God, honestly, we see a lot of this in our daily lives. We see people who seem to be unruly. And as, even as the psalmist says, why do the heathen rage? But God, we thank you that you're sovereign, that you're in control, and God, you're still good no matter what happens. And God, help us to respond in a way of trusting you, faith in you, and not questioning you even when we see things happen that we just don't understand. Thank you for all you do for us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming.